Good morning, Church, and welcome to Bartley. We are thankful that uh, you're able to join us on site here in Bartley itself. And uh, we thank you also for uh, being punctual, coming early. And this is something that we'd like to encourage our congregation to do so. And for those who are tuning online, we welcome you too. Uh, today we'll be having our communion. And uh, if you have not picked up the elements as you're walking in, uh, please do so and uh, or raise your hand and the ushers will pass to you the elements. And for those who are joining online, uh, we, we ask that you will prepare the elements before the start of the worship. Let's quieten our hearts as we prepare to enter into a time of worship, shall we? Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this new day that we can come together as a body of Christ to worship you. Come fill us with your spirit and make us one. May we come with a posture of anticipation and joy to worship you this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Shall we rise, church, and read together this portion of scripture from Psalms 24? Together, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Amen. Put your hands together.
this is the call that He has to each and every single one of us. Reading from Luke chapter 9. Then He said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self?
gather here. We gather here by your grace. All because of the cross that we would come for and find life in Jesus. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 to 58. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. The moon and stars, they wept. Son was dead, the savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon him.
45, the Lord says, I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. You heavens above, rain down my righteousness. Let the clouds shower it down. Let the earth open wide. Let salvation spring up. Let righteousness flourish with it. I, the Lord have created it. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but potsherds among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say, the potter has no hands? Church, what is our response to our God who is all glorious, who is sovereign?
Good morning, church. What an amazing God that we have, that we serve. Yeah. Um, once again, welcome to the communion table. This welcome is extended 
at the table is open to all who have called upon the Lord Jesus as their own personal Lord and Savior, who have called upon the name and come to faith in Him. And for those of us who are visiting with us for the first time, um, we just ask that you observe and uh, not, not partake of the elements. This morning as we are preparing for the communion, I would just like us to remember and consider two things that um, the sacrifice of Christ and the elements of the table remind us of. The first thing is our salvation. What are we saved from? We, you have... You have heard what um, the worship leader has read earlier on, the sting of death, sin and death, alienation from God, a rebellion against God that you know, we, we find ourselves so helpless to, to not, not be in rebellion against God. That is the sin, and that is the effect of sin. And that rebellion consequence is death an eternal separation from God. And this is what we are saved from. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, in the upper room, he told his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And as we take the elements later, we remember that his broken body, the blood that was shed, frees us and saves us from that sin and death and from that condemnation. The second thing I want us to remember as we partake of the communion is our sanctification. What are we saved for? Our salvation and what are we saved from? And our sanctification, what are we saved for? We are all made in the image of God and through sin that image has been marred. And we come to faith in Christ. We are set on a, a path of transformation back to the image through conforming to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. And again, on the upper room, um, on the night He was betrayed, Jesus said this to His disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. And this is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. So as we partake of the communion later, I just, before that, I just want to give all of us some time to ponder how have our lives been? Um, have we been thankful? Have we been grateful for the salvation that we receive? Have we been careful that we live our life under the influence, under the guidance, under the empowering of the Holy Spirit, that our lives may bear witness to the, to the salvation that He brings? So I'm just going to give us some time uh, for us to to ponder, and then I will lead us in the taking of the elements.
Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and after giving thanks, he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you have your elements with you, take up the bread and let's partake it together. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. And he said, this is the cup which is the new covenant in my blood. And as often as you do it, remember me. Let's partake of the cup together. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your great and tender mercies towards us. That you not only save us, but set us on the path of sanctification. That in our lives we reflect your very presence through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that in you we have hope. That our lives become more and more showing the life of the Son in us. And we thank you that you call us by living that life to bear witness that Jesus is the Son of God. He has come and give himself for for us, for all who are in our lives, that they may know that you sent Jesus to save them as well. So help us, Father, to be grateful for the salvation and be careful, Lord, to tend to the sanctification of our lives. We pray, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And as part of that sanctification, we know that we need always for the Holy Spirit, which God has given us, to lead us into the understanding of His Word. And as we prepare our hearts to hear the words of God, the worship team is going to Lead us in this song as a prayer to prepare us. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new to my willing soul bring the presence of the risen lord to renew my heart and make me whole cause your word to come alive in me give me faith for what i can For your purity, Holy Spirit, breathe new life in me. Holy Spirit, come abide within me, your joy. Christ. 
to know I do. Let us continue in the spirit of worship by preparing our hearts for tithe and offering. As you prepare your tithes and offerings with the envelopes provided as you, before you walk in, and do drop it in the boxes, offering boxes in the back and the front of the hall when you exit. And for those who are at home, you can still prepare your tithes and offerings and give it through electronically. Let us all rise as we give thanks for the tithe and offering. Almighty God, we give thanks to you, O God, for our daily providence, for providing what we need and when we need it. We offer our gifts to you, Lord, with grateful, cheerful hearts. Accept our offerings and tithes as we know, in full confidence, that we use these gifts to further your kingdom. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Before you sit down, I'll let you greet one another with a wave of a hand to your left and right, front and back. And of course, you can start practicing your Gong Si Gong Si. Okay. Uh, yes, Chinese New Year is really around the corner, and uh, we are really looking forward to it, isn't it? Uh, and uh, please be seated. And I'm sure that uh, you are busy preparing and uh, doing your spring cleaning, you know, uh, doing your last minute shopping. Uh, we know this year is going to be a very special year. Um, and uh, all of us need to really adjust ourselves, right? As for this Chinese New Year, as we have to um, um, follow the, the, the safe distance measures and things like this. And, and this is really a special year also that uh, I think we also would need to remember that it's a time for reunion, reunion with our families and with our friends and our, our, and our social circles. And uh, we can do it in a very creative ways too. So let us pray for this Chinese New Year celebration in the midst of this COVID season. And also we will pray for Pastor Ma as we give us the message. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this coming Chinese New Year celebration, for these annual family gatherings that can help us cement our family ties. We are mindful that in this COVID situation, many families are not able to be reunited as the borders are closed. We pray that they may be comforted and safe. Help us, O oh Lord, to be able to be sensitive to these people, to them who, could, who don't have families to celebrate with, and also for those who are alone at home. May we extend our hospitality to them. May this season be also be an opportunity for relationships to be healed, as we know many families' relationships are fragmented. Father, give us the bonus to witness and share your love to our family and friends during this festive season. The light of Christ will permeate many more hearts. And now let us pray for Pastor Ma. O oh God, announce Pastor Ma, Pastor Ma as he gives your word to us. Open our hearts and minds by the power of the Holy Spirit, that as the, spirits are, as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear what you are saying to us today. In Christ's most precious name we pray. Amen. Let's sit back and watch this video.
challenge you to download the Bible is app and to hear the words of Jesus couldn't be simpler. Listen to the Bible together. So the idea that the one campaign that started right here in Hong Kong is now going global is, is thrilling. Join us on a daily journey of scripture, discussion, meditation, and prayer with people from different denominations, different cultural backgrounds, different age groups, and people from all walks of life. So then the Lord Jesus berkata-kata dengan mereka, "Hulai, pei jie dao tian shang." Se sing tuo la dei cha de Dios, con cac tong do thi ra di rao zang khap ne. Even nirubita disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the The sound of millions of people. Sound of God reaching out to us. Will you be a part of it? Come and join us. I invite you. Mari kita menyertai. Hearts will be transformed. Jesus spoke, and the people heard it. That's going to bring the people of God together, and we know that where there is unity, that there is favor and outpouring of God's blessing. It'll change your life. And we are looking forward to 1-2021. Don't miss it. So please join us. Believe with us, uniting in faith, in vision, and in spirit. The One Campaign 2021. What you just watched was an introduction to the one campaign that we mentioned about last Sunday. It will be the unifying campaign for our missioner sales launch, starting from Lent, 17 February to the 4th of April, Easter Sunday. We shall talk more about this later on. Meanwhile, into today's topic, faith comes by hearing, and hearing from the Word of God. Well, <clears throat> can we have the screen uh, on the TV on as well? Yes, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> it's taken from Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes from hearing, and let's just go back into the background of Romans chapter 10, and we will talk about verse 1 to 3, and verse 14 to 21. The word of the Lord from Romans chapter 10, verse 1 to 3, and verse 14 to 21. Paul was speaking to the people, especially of Israel. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And then in verse 14, Paul says, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And, sorry, I'm not following my words. And how shall they preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. 
but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? And then the very verse that we are going to preach on today, verse 17 says, So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses say, I will provoke you to be jealous to, to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Brothers and sisters, you see, Paul began his message here in Romans chapter 10, expressing his very burden. Here he says his heart's desire, his prayer, is for Israel's salvation through Christ. They were so near, but yet, in Paul's understanding, they were so far apart from Christ. And then, in verse 14 to verse 15, Paul began to retrace the sequence when one comes to faith in Christ. And this was what he, he said sequentially. He says, to, for a person to call on Christ, really he needs first to believe. And in order to believe, he needs first to hear. And in order to hear, we need to a preacher. And in order for a preacher to preach, he needs to be sent. And this is very powerful. But then Paul also addressed a problem. If we jump on, he later on says, but the problem is this, is that Israel did not obey. Israel did not believe. In verse 16, he mentioned that. It's as though Paul is saying that, well, they have heard the call, they have heard everything that the preacher said, but they have not believed. And Paul goes on to list. He said that they had heard from God's general revelation. Okay? They have heard. And then more than just that, but they have also heard, knew from Moses and from Isaiah, representing the law and the prophets, that the salvation of the Gentiles was to provoke them to return to Christ, but yet at the same time, they remain disobedient and even contrary or against God. So, this sequence of belief, Paul go on to put, you know, he says, you know, calling upon Christ, believing in Him, and then hearing and then preaching. He went on to summarize all of that, actually, in verse 17, and he says this. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. From the color code, you can already see, you know, Paul was summarizing it. The belief that I'm talking about is the faith that you need to have. And you can get this faith by hearing. And where do you, what do you hear is more important. You hear the Word of God that was preached to you. So these three things are the very three things that I want to address for us today. Faith, the hearing, and the Word of God that we are going to talk about today. Faith, the first thing. What is faith? This is a very elemental question, but yet it is a very important question that perhaps many of us may not have done a proper study of and therefore may not really fully appreciate what faith is really about. You see, the word faith occurs at least 243 times in the New Testament. And it is often translated, it is, the, it is from the word pistis in Greek, and it's often translated as meaning belief, trust, confidence, and even fidelity and faithfulness. But I want to tell us that there are really three features in this word, original word, faith, pistis, that can help us understand the word faith better. The first of these is this. 
Okay. <clears throat> but before, before we go into that, maybe I want to ask you, huh, before we enter into that, a question. What do you think is biblical faith? If I give you these two pictures, which one do you think is biblical faith? Is this A, biblical faith? Or is this B, biblical faith? Which one is faith? How many of you say A? Not many hands. Huh? How many of you say B? A number of hands. How many of you say A and B? Nobody. Nobody. Not, not many. How many of you say neither? <laughs> well, we shall come to that later on. Okay? But first of all, the understanding of the word pistis of faith is that it is derived from the word, another Greek word, sorry, okay, called peto, which really means to persuade, to have confidence, to be persuaded of what is trustworthy. Now, this is the root word from which the word faith comes from. In other words, faith is not something that comes from the person doing the trusting. It is something that you generate, that I have great faith, I can do these things. But faith is really persuaded on the person who is doing the trusting by the person who is being trusted. That I am able to persuade you to have faith in me. So when you begin to see that, you begin to understand that faith is fostered, or faith is persuaded externally on the truster by the trustee that is the object of faith or the object of trust. In other words, just by repeating to yourself, if you are ha having coming into a very difficult situation, says, I must have faith, I must have faith. And the more I say I must have faith, the more I say I have my faith, 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 I will have lots of faith. Is that true? That's not true. You don't have faith in faith alone. You don't have faith in faith itself. You see, your faith grows. Your faith is persuaded only in relation to your growth, in your understanding, in your connection, in your relationship to that which you are putting your faith in. You understand that? The greater your relationship, the more understanding you have on that object of faith, the greater your faith will be persuaded upon you by that object of faith. And that object of faith in your life, as you grow up, may have been your parents, certain point of your life, your teachers, even the science that you have come to understand can be the object of your faith. The government, for example, an actual object like a tree branch, for example, that you're climbing, it can be an object of faith. As you trusted it more, you can realize that you can even jump on it because it can support your weight. Okay? Or even a friend can be an object of faith. But most important, in your Christian walk, that object of faith has been your God and the Word of God, the Bible itself. So because faith, pistis, is persuaded upon us by God, therefore it is very correct to say that faith is always a gift from God. Faith is not something that you can say, I have more faith than you have. Faith is a gift from God. It is really something persuaded to us upon us by God. And that's what Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 say. Faith is always a gift from God. In that sense, we can actually say this, that faith is really God's divine persuasion. Okay? God's attraction of us to trust in Him. So having this understanding now, let me ask you again this question. Which of these two then is a picture of biblical faith. I think most of you got it correct. Yes, this is biblical faith. It is about learning to trust in somebody. Whereas A is really about self-confidence. Unless you are telling me that that man has faith in that rock that the, on the opposite side, that it is near enough and it is able to support his weight. But which is quite unlikely so in this picture as we can see. It is more self-confidence. So faith is not really about something that we produce ourselves. It is therefore not self-belief or self-confidence as we understand it to be. Now, the second thing that we need to know about faith is this. So first, 
It's that faith is something that we have on the person that we trust in, okay? Second thing that we need to know, that this faith, this business, also relates in ancient time to the concept of guarantee or warranty. And in this sense, when it applies to the Bible, we come to understand that this faith is really about God's warranty, God's certifying that salvation that he in birth will come to pass his way, doing things his, his way. It's just like the song that we sang just now. Okay? He meets us in our mornings. He is sovereign over all. When you say God is sovereign over all, is he doing things his way and he say, you can trust me. And so, when we buy a new equipment or a new appliance a day, we talk about a warranty. Does it come with a warranty? And some places, they give you extended warranty. And because of that, we have faith that we can continue to use that thing. Okay? Well, in the same way, I think God is our warranty. And that's why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, 1, this is the, therefore the definition of faith. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. And the, the writer of Hebrews is telling us all this because of the warranty, of the confidence, of the guarantee that we have in a Father God who is able to deliver according to the way He is sovereign. So, in the Bible, faith is in God who is totally trustworthy and is never only a wishful hope or a personal confidence, okay? Now, third thing about faith that is very important for us to learn is this, is that faith has also got to do with the word faithfulness. This is not just faith alone, it is faithfulness. What I mean by this is this, is that real faith is more than just believing in God. It includes the acting out of the faith by serving God and by obeying God's command. And that's exactly what the author of the book of James says. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You see, faithfulness actually speaks of a living faith, an ongoing faith, a continuous faith, a continual keeping of faith. Now, what do I mean by this? If you liken faith as a gift from God, Faith is more like a living thing as a gift from God. It's not like God gives you, like, you know, I give you a, a book for you to keep. If I give you a book for you to keep, you know, you can put it on the shelf, and for 1,000 years you don't touch the book, it will still remain the same. But faith is not that. Faith is more like, you know, if God entrusts to you a pet dog, and you keep the pet dog, and you say, for 1,000 years I leave it on the shelf, what will happen to your pet dog? You get pet skeletons at the end. <laughs> or a plant. You, know, you have to take care of the, of the plant. So faith is really something like this. Faith is more like a living thing. It needs to be kept alive through daily use and daily engagement. It is continuous. The faith is need faithfulness on our part to keep it going. Because if you don't nurture faith, it will die. It will die. And therefore, it comes to our second important point about faith, is that faith needs to be nurtured. Okay? Faith needs to be nurtured. You see, faith is really, like I mentioned here, it's like a plant here. It's like as though God gives us a, a gift, and it comes in a potted plant. And it's a real potted plant, it's not fake plastic potted plant. And it is a real plant that is growing out from soil. Now, I, 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 I just imagine, you know, you, if you can... You know, put together this and say that, think of faith, faith like that plant. And the word of God is like the soil that's in the pot of plant. And God says, together, this faith and this word, that my word, I'm giving to you as a gift for you, you know, for, to, to bless you. What would you do to that? Okay? Now, when you receive a pot of flowers, okay, again, you don't just put it on a nice place and then display it and then forget about it. What do you need to do? Many of us, we buy flowers during this period of time for Chinese New Year. What do you do? You need to water the plant. 
right? You need to, you know, make work on the soil. You need to put nutrients onto it. I think in the same way, when you talk about faith and you talk about hearing the word of God, hearing, later on I'll be telling you, is really about working the soil so that the faith can grow. Then this is really the, the relationship I want us to see here. Okay? That we need to really work on it together. What will happen if you never water the plant? The plant will die. And friends, tragically, that's exactly what many Christians are doing with their faith and with the word of God in their life. These are the very gifts that God has entrusted to us. But we have left this gift untended in our lives. Okay? So they may have initially accepted the work and the, and, the, and the faith with joy and with thankfulness. But after a while, they left them aside. The word is not cultivated and the faith with us. Be careful that you may be keeping only, therefore, a dead faith. If so, then there is no faithfulness in you and in I. Okay? What then does it mean to work the soil and to cultivate the plant of hearing? And that's where we come to the next part. The Bible says, faith comes by hearing. Now you understand that. The faith will only blossom and grow when you hear and till the soil. Okay? Now, what is here? To hear is really to obey in the Bible many times. It is to act in response. James again mentioned this in James chapter 1, verse 22. Be doers of God's word and not just hearers only, deceiving yourself. James is telling us hearing really means doing. Okay? And the value of the Bible is really not in knowing it, but it is in obeying it. So don't just say to pastor, pastor, I do not know the Bible, teach me the Bible. But I think more important say, not only do I don't know the Bible, but I have not yet applied the Bible into my life. I want wisdom, and wisdom is applied knowledge, and not just knowledge alone. And many men of God, down history, have left behind us testimonials of their understanding of God's word, okay? That, uh, that the value of the Bible is not just in knowing it, but really in obeying it. Take, for example, Billy Graham. He was the one who made this simple statement. He says, the Bible can change your lives okay, as you read it and as you obey its teaching every day. Simple instructions. But how many of us really, really allow the Bible to come into our life every day? Do we interact with the Bible? Every day, do we allow the Bible to change our lives? Okay, simple instructions have we followed. Going back a bit later, D.L. Moody, Dwight Moody mentioned this. The Bible, he said, was not given to increase our knowledge that you may know more things. But again, he says, to change your life. And that change come about when you begin to hear and obey and water the plants and you see the plant changing before you. Soren Kierkegaard, okay, a, a European uh, theologian, mentioned this. He says, when you hear or read God's word, you must constantly be saying to yourself, it's talking to me and about me, not about us saying or our being. Okay, not about my wife or not about my children. It's talking to me. Make it personal. In other words, God is speaking to you. What are you doing to your own life? And this is what faith is all about. This is what hearing is all about. And the other thing we need to understand about hearing is this. As we mentioned in Paul's word, faith comes by hearing. What does that really mean? What does faith comes by hearing really mean? You see, Romans 10, 17 says this, faith comes first, actually, by hearing. How does faith come by hearing? Okay, on the careful analysis of the Bible, careful analysis of history and even on the operation of the church, we can understand that really faith comes first by hearing. First of all, you see, the Bible actually was originally written more to be read and heard then to be studied and to be investigated, okay? Well, in the Bible, the scriptures are really often read aloud for an audience. Do you know that? For example, Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 31, 
He instructed the people of Israel to read the law of the Lord to the people periodically. Okay? Every how many years, he said he had to read it openly to everybody so that they all hear God's word. So the Bible, right from the beginning, was written to be read and to be heard. Joshua, the successor of Moses, he read aloud all the words of the law before the whole assembly, Joshua chapter 8 tells us, okay, when Israel entered the promised land. Jeremiah, the prophet in Jeremiah 36, he instructed Baruch, his assistant, to read his scroll before the people in the temple, to read it out aloud okay, before the people. King Josiah, in, in 2 Kings and in 2 Chronicles, he read the book of the covenant to all the people in Jerusalem and he led them to make a response by making a covenant with the Lord. And then when the people returned from the exile, Ezra read and taught the law to the people. And right even in the New Testament, Luke recorded in the book of Acts that you know, Moses' law was read and preached in the synagogue on a weekly basis. And then finally, Paul, when he wrote his letters, we know that most of the New Testament epistles were read openly in the church because nobody at that time can print the Bible so that everybody can have a copy of their own Bible. Nobody understand and can read every word in the, book, in, in the written document. And so the word has to be read to them. And not only just that, but Colossians chapter 4, verse 16 Tell us that the very letter of Colossians that they are supposed to be reading is supposed to be passed to the church in Laodicea. And they are supposed to exchange the letter that Paul wrote to Laodicea and read it in Colossae. In other words, we understand that the letters of Paul and the early Christian leaders were being passed around churches, read around publicly in congregations, okay, in everywhere. In fact, Revelation itself is the proof Revelation talks about letters to the seven churches. Okay? It talks about the same book of, Le Re book of Revelation was actually circulated, we understand, at least among the seven churches. In fact, Revelation had this additional saying. You know, it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart, what is written in it. Because the time is near. If the Bible originally was written to a man to be read aloud, I think there's certainly a lot of gem, a lot of treasure that we can pick up if we also learn to read it aloud and hear it aloud often, instead of just quietly, as in our modern days where we read it quietly in our own hearts. So it's often a good exercise to read the Bible aloud. I overheard this uh, conversation uh, and uh, this person says, uh, I just wish God would speak to me. And then the reply was, you know, read the Bible. <laughs> and then he said, ah, you don't understand me. La. No, I, I don't mean, to, you know, I mean to, uh, like out loud that God will speak out loud to me. Then the person said, then read your Bible out loud. <laughs> read your Bible out loud. <laughs> yes. How many times do you want to hear God speak to you aloud? <laughs> And then read the Bible out loud, and God will speak to you aloud. Well, secondly, it's not only just that, but we also understand that even today, in today's context, speaking and listening remains a fundamental mode of ministry even within the church today. Take, for example, the day that you come to know the Lord, evangelism. How, let me just ask you, how many of us come to Christ because we heard or we listened to a spoken message or a gospel presented to us? Put up your hands. How many of you? I think many of us, right? I came to know the Lord because somebody bothered to open his or her mouth and tell me about the gospel. Somebody brave enough was willing to stop me and tell me, let me share with you the gospel. It was a proclamation that has been heard, that has been read in front of me, and I responded to it. Of course, some of us may not have come to Christ in that way. Some of us may have come to Christ because we ourselves personally read of certain articles. Okay? Some of us may even have special encounters with God not to be repeated in other people. 
But most probably, I think the majority of us would dare say that we come to know Christ because we hear, because we heard something that has been read out or something that has been spoken to us. This might be by an individual sat privately next to us on an informal basis and he just chat with us and we come to hear about gospel. Or this might even be in an auditorium like this where a preacher behind a pulpit preached formally to us. Or even over the radio station where somebody preached the message to us formally. But whatever the case, you can understand that speaking Listening remained that fundamental mode of ministry leading many people to Christ. And not only just leading people to Christ, okay, we find that one-to-one follow-up, for example, has to do with a lot of mentoring, has to do a lot of talking. When you want to bring up somebody in discipleship, you brought the person along and say, let me just share with you and teach you the Bible. Isn't that speaking? Isn't that listening? Small group discipleship, And then we talk about cell ministry. Isn't that all about speaking and listening ministry as well? And even right now at this very place, when you come on this Sunday here, you are being spoken to because this is a speaking ministry, preaching ministry. When you pray, isn't it about praying out aloud to the Lord? When you worship, isn't it about singing out aloud to the Lord many times until this COVID when we have to restrict ourselves? Well, and I want to tell you this, that hearing actually remains actually the only way to receive the message for some people's group in the world. I did a research, and uh, this website uh, from this, uh, what they call it, uh, Omniglot, which is an online encyclopedia for writing systems and languages. And this is that there are actually 7,117 languages spoken in the world today. So accurate, huh? 7,117. And it says that of what they know, of the calculated, that of these 3,982, or about 56% of these languages have written form. Okay? However, of all these which have written form, many are actually also rarely written. Okay? Or few of the speakers are able to read or write them anymore. In other words, although they have written form, very few are literate in them, and they are on the verge of extinction. And that actually means that there are actually 44% of the world's languages have no written form. So if you are thinking of using the written form to print a Bible and to reach out to them, you have to wait a long time. You have to wait a long time because we had the first help them to reinvent their letter, their, their language into script, and then to translate their letter, their, their, their language, in, the, the, the Bible into their language and put them into script, and hopefully teach them how to read, and then they will learn from their own language how to read the Bible in their own language. But there are 44% of languages that still have no, no words you know, written of their language. Just in Africa alone, by the way, Okay, Africa, there are 2,294 languages that are spoken alone, okay? more than any other continent in the world. Okay? But 80% of African languages have no written form. 80%, majority of them has no written form. So really for many people in the world, hearing remains the only way they can receive a message. Faith indeed comes by hearing. Faith indeed comes by hearing. Even as I speak to you here, Lisa is signing. Lisa is signing to those deaf people who cannot understand. The deaf language is actually another language okay, that we're talking about here that in a sense is a hearing that it needs to be heard in the deaf signs. Okay? It is another language. The hearing will need to come to build faith. Well, what do we hear? We need to hear, therefore, the Word of God. We need to hear the Word of God. We don't just hear anything in this world, right? Because there are many contradictory voices in this world that come and play against us. What do we hear? We need to hear the Word of God. How do we hear? How do we hear the Word of God? I think it's a question that I really want to leave with us here. How do we hear the Word of God? Okay. Now, 
I'd like you to do something here. Take out your left hand right now, can you? Can you raise your hand right now? Okay. And then look into the palm of your left hand right now. What do you see? Do you see six arrows? You don't see, uh? Six arrows, do you see six arrows there? No, you don't see. Okay, in a moment you will see because I want you to see six hours in your hand later on. Okay, okay. and this is how I like you to, to help you with six hours in your hands to remember how to read the Bible for yourself, how we can hear God's word and build faith in our life. The first hour is the word hour, is for the word receive. And if you can put it right in the center of your palm, you say, this is where I receive my things, right in the center of my palm to receive. Okay? And this is what I think we need to come to God with. Firstly, an open palm to receive. You see, many of us come to God and we cry out to God, God, give me something. And when our hands are clenched and we refuse to open to God and we want our own ways and we insist our own way and we speak our own terms, and God has no chance to speak into our life. The first word R talk about an attitude in all of us, surrender. It talk about us coming before the word of God with trust. It talk about us wanting to build the relationship of trust that we talked about just now, of faith. That God, you want to build faith in me. I want to open and receive you. I want to open and receive your word. Okay? And that's exactly what the Bible say in James again. Therefore, get rid of all moral fear and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word of God planted in you which can save you. I don't know whether you ignore the word humbly or not, but it's a very powerful word here. The Lord says, are you humble enough to come with me, before me, with this open palm to receive with teachability, with openness, with receptivity? of ditch that I want to give to you. We all need to be like the good soil, the good soil that Jesus talked about when he talked about a parable of the sower. Okay? It is conclusion in Matthew chapter 13, verse 18 to 23, he mentioned this. He says, but the seed falling on the good soil refers to someone who hears the word of God and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. And this is what the Lord wants us to do. That my seed that is planted in you, is it going to bear fruit in your life or not? But in the first place, are you willing to set the right condition to receive this word of God into your life? Now, that's the first R. The second R will be in your thumb. It is important, okay, as you thumb through things. Okay, it is to read. Read here also suggests listening. Okay, read and listening together. Okay, the Bible in Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, just now I mentioned this verse already. Okay, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Have you got a reading or listening plan? Or are you merely skipping about Every time when at random, the Lord, you, know, you say, at random, when I got time, I read the Bible. Do you eat that way? At random, I got time, I eat uh, some rice. At random, I got time, I eat this. No, it's not going to be nutritious to you. But if you have a nutritious plan, you know what you are eating for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. You set aside time for you to read, for you to eat. In the same way, in our spiritual life, have we kept those spiritual discipline in eating, in reading God's Word? Have you taken a few minutes each day to read a chapter a day or to read even a few chapters a day? And that's what we wanted people to do through this one campaign to really listen to God's Word. Okay? But we should also block out extended time, sometimes to spend longer time with the Lord. So do not just be satisfied with your nibbles. Say, God, I read one chapter a day and very good already. No have extended time to read the Word of God. Perhaps in the weekend, you have extended time to sleep in and sleep late. Would you have extended time to also, therefore, read God's Word for more on the weekends? And one of the best ways to have extended time is not only just to read the Word of God, it goes to our next one. Using your index finger, okay, you need to point as you read in detail. 
It's what we call research or study. Study the Word of God. The Bible has a lot of time talked about studying the Word of God. Okay? One of them, 2 Timothy 2.15, is my favorite. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Can you tell yourself, I want to handle God's word correctly? I don't want to just listen to what people tell me and, and be swayed by them. Can I handle the word accurately? That has to motivate all of us that we ourselves personally have to take this personal responsibility to handle the word of God with care. How can we learn and grow spiritually if we do not even spend time studying this very book that God has made himself known to all of us? You see, there's a difference between reading and studying. Okay? And the difference is this, is asking questions. The difference is asking questions. When you read, you can just read and then you say, okay, let the word just come upon me. But when you study, you begin to ask questions. You ask why, you ask what, you ask where, you ask how, you ask when, you ask all the questions that you can ask about it. And then there's another part about, about studying that makes a difference with reading. It's making connections. It's making connection. Now, if this part of the Bible tell me this, but another part of the Bible seems to be contradictory to it. How does these two connect? Then you will begin to study the Bible and understand the Bible and know, oh, how do I harmonize the idea that the Bible is trying to tell me here? So it is about asking questions and about making connections. Very, very simple. And the next thing is, but you don't just study and say that that's very good. I think we need to remember Okay? The longest finger that you have tell you, therefore, this is the most important thing eh, about it. It's about remembering. Remembering. Psalms 119 verse, 19, verse 11 says this, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The psalmist, you know, is very good at this. Eh? Hidden God's word. Hide God's word. To hide means what? That means, you know, I, I purposely keep it secure in my heart. That means I will not lose it. To not lose it means what? That means I have it in my head. That means when I, I don't even have my Bible before me, I will remember it. To hide it means I treasure it. To hide it means it's something that is important to me. You know, I hide my money. You know, I hide my, my, my precious things from other people you know, because they are important to me. So how do you remember God's word? I always tell people, okay, a short pencil it's longer than a long, long memory. <laughs> a short pencil is better than a long memory. Sometimes I say, oh, I remember, I remember, I remember. But sometimes it's good to just journal and write down. Today we have the iPhone, uh, we have the smartphone. You can put everything in your smartphone also. Okay? I like to read books you know, with a pencil because I like to engage by writing and drawing all over the book. Okay, and that may be your way too. Okay? But the most important thing to really remember is really to memorize. Memorize scriptures. Okay? And that will be a good way to help us be filled with God's word moment by moment. You know, as you begin to memorize God's word, you'll begin to be able to do the, the next thing, okay? which is one of the most difficult things, okay? which is the word reflect. Most difficult because it's on one of the weakest fingers that we have, okay? the ring finger. Okay? which is also a very important finger, huh? where you put your ring. Okay? Well, reflect means what? So always look at it, always remember it. Okay? The Bible says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, okay, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so you may be careful to do everything in it. Meditate on it. And then, again in Psalms 119, it mentioned this. Okay, uh, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it day and night. Reflection is really meditation. What is meditation? Okay, it's not like what the Eastern religion tell us. Meditation is about, you know, emptying your mind. Okay, that is the Eastern idea of meditation. But the bigger idea of meditation is this. It's to think is to have a conversation with God over and over again on what you have learned. Meditation means that after I read the Bible, after I've listened to the sermon, 
When I go back, I keep thinking about that which God has spoken into my heart. And I have a conversation with God in my heart all the time. Okay? And that is meditation. Somebody say this, if you know how to worry, then you know how to meditate. Because worry is the opposite of meditation. In worry, you think about a negative things all the time. You know? Even before you sleep, you can't help it, but you think about it. When you go to sleep, you dream about it. When you wake up, you think about it. That's worry. If we can only replace that with meditation, it will be the word of God that you are thinking about engaging all the time. Before you sleep, as you go to sleep, as you dream, as you wake up with the word of God with you. Okay? And that, that's just exactly what we talk about here in reflecting. This is meditation. Well, the last one is really the last hour. I hope you remember. It is responding. It is no use just knowing the Bible and keeping it afloat in your mind and not doing anything. Remember, we say hearing is really acting in response to the Word of God. Respond to the Word of God. Respond to the Word of God. Okay? In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to verse 25, it says, Therefore, everyone who hears this word of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock, and then when the rain comes down, when the stream rose and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it has its foundation upon the rock. The question is, how many of us really act upon the Word of God? It is about applying God's Word into our lives. I want to tell you this is on the last finger. It's the weakest finger because this is the least and the hardest step to be practiced in many of our lives. So can you remember all the five, six hours? Okay? And I hope we can remember this as we look at our palms next, next time. Okay? Whether we have to receive God's words, read God's words, research God's words, remember God's words, reflect on God's word, and then make a response to God's word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This, therefore, has to be the foundation for our missional selves and our one campaign that we are talking about. May I remind all of us here, okay, at this point of time, that uh, when we're talking about missional cells and missional disciples, okay, we are really talking about the necessity of having faith, okay, in order to know because we have to know the direction of our faith, okay, to, to talk about propagation of our faith, okay, to talk about growing in our faith, and we talk about the word of God that comes into place and the necessity of us hearing it, okay. So faith comes by hearing the word of God is really foundation to all of this. And so last week we talked about this uh, commitment. We were thankful that uh, to date we have close to 400 names that have come in, but including some repetition, some of you, you know, accidentally tap and press your but the button two times. We got more than two times of your name. Thank you for your doubly assurance of your commitment. Okay, but still many of you probably have not written. Some of you thought that by, by doing so, you're already signing up for your wife or your husband. Okay? Please ask them to sign up on their own or so. Because we really like to know which individual who is signed up for this uh, uh, missional cell commitment. Okay? So scan this code here if you have not yet done your commitment or you, have, you do not know what I'm talking about. Okay? We're asking people to give a recommitment to the, to the cell ministry. Okay? And just by signing this simple form to us. And some of the people who sign up this may say that, no, we want to be sent. We want to take this opportunity to be sent to help another cell. Please let us know also. We have more than 20 people who have tell us, told us about this already. And then we also have about you know, close to 10 to 20 people who are new, who have signed up for Mission of Cell as a result. We encourage you, if you are new, to also sign up for this Mission of Cell. But recall, with me, last week when we say it's about the mission itself, what was the first step that we talk about here? That we say it's being missional. It is being disciples, remember? Being disciples. And being disciples starts with our faith. Okay? It starts with our relationship with God and His Word. Okay? The question is, have we, have we been building our faith? Have we been dwelling into the Word of God, okay? And that's really what we want ourselves to be asking ourselves, okay? And so the one campaign that we talk about here is not only just a common campaign of oneness. 
I think it is a campaign of coming to build faith by hearing, literally hearing the word of God together. Okay? And uh, it is going to be done during the 17th to the 4th, uh, 17th of April, which is just in a week's time, okay? So the 4th of April, okay? It starts with a, on three levels, as we mentioned, on a personal level, on a small group level, and on a church level. But before I go on further, I'd like you to watch this video, okay? And uh, probably, okay, if you have spotted uh, familiar faces just now, you have spotted more familiar faces right now in this local Singapore video. Let's have the video. Jesus often said, let him who has ears, let him hear. I'm listening to an account of the life of Jesus. 10 minutes a day over just 40 days. Added to that, we have a weekly video of about 20 minutes of significant events in the life of Jesus. Also, a weekly sermon which you can watch either online through YouTube or on-site in the church premises. 이렇게 함으로써 우리는 가슴절 40일 기간 동안에 하나님의 말씀에 집중적으로 우리가 몰입하고 하나님의 말씀에 집중하는 그런 시간을 갖게 되는 것입니다. 不但如此, 我们还跟世界各地的弟兄姐妹一起的来参与. Now, this movement is already gaining more momentum than we thought. We wanted three international cities, three US cities. But already we have five or six US cities that are asking to be involved. In other words, one is not a, a Protestant one or a Catholic one, a charismatic one or an evangelical one. It's not an international one or a local one. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And when I think of that, that just really excites me because that's going to bring the people of God together. And we know that where there is unity, that there is favor and outpouring of God's blessing. <laughs> This whole project has its continuity because right now with uh, something so accessible as inside our cell phone and uh, with so many books that we could continue to read in the Bible, we can continue uh, this project in the years to come. Let us unite our hearts together as one church during this one campaign to hear the one word that comes from the one Lord. We are excited as we believe God will speak to us, instruct us, inspire us, and encourage us as we spend this time together listening to His word. So as mentioned, this one campaign is really on a three-level uh, kind of things. Okay? First, on an individual level. Okay? On the 17th of February, Ash Wednesday, when it starts, we urge everybody you know, to adopt a schedule like this to begin to listen to portions of the Gospels. Okay? We're talking about if you do it in 40 days, during the weekdays of uh, Mondays to Saturdays on land, there will be 40 of those days, you'll be able to cover the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, and John. Okay? And therefore, you'll have a very wonderful stereoscopic understanding of the life of Jesus from different angles altogether. If you want to, on the Sundays, you can add on to the reading, uh, the reading of the Gospel of Mark or the listening to the Gospel of Mark also. Okay, and uh, so this is on a very personal level. So it's something that is very doable for all of us because you know you can actually download this, you know, the Bible.is or Bible.is uh, app onto your smartphone. Okay, and uh, you can even scan this uh, QR code right now to enter to get that app right now. Okay, whether it's Android or uh, or, or Apple. Okay, and then. The, there's instructions, and we have instructions even in our own church website to teach you how to download these things, okay? And how to set the dates for yourself, to monitor for yourself. And listening of God's word. 
So for this period of time, I just urge all of us, you know, even if you have already have your own set of devotional material or quiet time, you can, you can begin to do this on your own uh, together um, so that you know that when you're doing it, you're doing it with other people in the church. Okay? And we can discuss the, the, the same passage together when we come and meet one another. On a second level, okay, uh, sorry, and here I am uh, here, uh, you know, talking to Lisa. Lisa was telling me, okay, now one, one, one of the problems we realize is that because of copyright issue, uh, the, the movie that, we, that, that comes with this, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, one campaign, you know, is reading directly from the Bible. So they cannot put it in terms of the subtitles. So our deaf community will not be able to see the subtitle. So Lisa has suggested that maybe there's some other ways that we can do it okay, for the deaf community, even through the deaf Bible or the deaf uh, missions the video. Okay? So we, 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 we will take care of that also. Okay, now, so therefore, there is also a second level, not only just on an individual level, okay, but on a missional cell level that we are talking about here. We're talking about the first five weeks of Lent to ask all of us to come together in missional cell, okay. So therefore, if you are not in a missional cell, we urge you to sign up, and then we would like to allocate you at least for this period of time, okay, to join and with a group and to learn together the Word of God. They'll be watching the Gospel of Mark in movie, okay, and the Gospel will be read to them. And then after that, we'll discuss the, 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 the Bible together in the missional cell, okay. And on the sixth, sixth week, okay, which is the Holy Week or Passion Week or the last week of Lent, which is the week in which we have Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday, we will not have a cell meeting. And the reason being this, okay, is that uh, because we want you to come together to church for those services. Those Gospel of Mark movie will be shown during the service on those days and we will not have discussion, but we will have sermons on those days instead. Okay? And by the way, every month, we, on the first Friday night of every month, we have a prayer and praise. Okay? In March, okay, March 1 to 6, there will be this missionary cell discussion on Gospel of Mark. We decided that we will not have the prayer and praise for, Mark, for March. <laughs> so that you can read Mark okay, together as a, as a, as a mission of cell. And finally, as a church, okay, uh, after next Sunday, the Chinese New Year Sunday, when you come together, we'll have a series of nice sermons on Mark to continue to help you integrate the understanding of the gospel. Indeed, it will be faith comes by hearing, and then hearing the word of God that will build us up. More than just that, I will tell you this is not the end, okay? Uh, by the way, you see at the end of it, uh, on the 9th of April, we have a celebration on the prayer and praise. So everybody, will, we encourage you to come together for the prayer and praise to celebrate the end of this reading of the four Gospels, okay? But that is still not the end, okay? I want to tell you there's also a follow-up event. We are planning that the second half of this year, in July, in August, and in September, Okay, we will have a feed class teaching on Saturdays on the Gospels and Christ. Okay, and in that class, we will also produce the resources, hopefully, that can help you resource the individual missionary cells to facilitate those teaching sessions when you go back to teach them. Okay? So really, if you want all these resources, they are already up there in our mission cell website, in the church website, okay? or you can scan here, and everything that you need to know about this uh, uh, one campaign and about mission cell is are all found over there. Okay? So, faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God is what we want to hear. As we build faith, may we each grow to become disciples, to make disciples and to send disciples. As the song that we had just uh, sung last Sunday talk about, it says, driven by love, do you all have heard? Let's carry Christ's name to the ends of the earth. Let's carry his love, shine with our light, till the whole world knows Christ and leave him high. And that's really our prayer that as we all commit ourselves to be disciples, make disciples, send disciples, and from ourselves being missional disciples, we will build into missional cells, becoming missional church for Him. Amen.
Shall we rise, church, as we close with the song? That indeed all that we do is because of the love of Christ.
Let's let the moment of quietness to let, us, let the Spirit continue to speak into our hearts. And let's make a personal response to the message that the Lord has then placed upon our own individual hearts. Let's receive the Lord's benediction. May you look back and remember the ways God has been good to you and has kept faith since the day you embraced Him and His Word. May you pause today and be mindful of His very Word given you. May you treasure it Act on it and let it blossom in your walk with Him. May you look forward with faith and expectancy as you seek to obey and be missional. Oh, let faith arise in your becoming disciples, making disciples and sending disciples. And now, unto Him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I would like to give you three important announcements. Uh, next Sunday is uh, Chinese New Year. We're going to have one English service at 9 a.m. So take note, we come here at 9 a.m. Okay. And the second an announcement I'd like to highlight is actually there is a PJ, the PJW Missions Endowment Fund. As Pastor John Willis, Endowment Fund, a collection uh, that we do that every Chinese New Year uh, for the projects uh, that we sponsor uh, for um, the third world countries and the uh, community development uh, projects. And so we encourage you to take an envelope, take an ampau, and put a, a, a donation or contribution in, and then drop it at the offering box. And for those who are at home, you can actually do that through online. And the details are in the bulletin. And the third announcement is that uh, we have actually uh, done a video uh, for the safe entry. So we encourage you to log into this uh, QR code and watch this video. And especially for those who are new and for those uh, we're expecting more people to join us at the end of this month as we start uh, twinkly, twink, twinkly yellow and, and, uh, and glowing green, uh, the kingdom jewels. Okay, service is over. Uh, but before we do that, let's watch the last uh, video announcement.
que eu acho que dessa vez solva. 